we're all here because we think about a common goal. And that common goal has been touched on by several of our introductory speakers. Um, we have that common goal whether we are sitting as researchers someplace, if we're in small business, um, if we're uh, insurance providers, we're here probably because we're all interested in something about how we might protect and promote worker health. And when we think about worker health and safety, we may think of a range of outcomes which have been listed by some of my um, the introducers here this morning. We think certainly about some of the traditional um, occupational health and health and safety exposures on the job that have been such a core part of NIOSH's tradition over many, many decades. But we also think increasingly about additional factors that are influencing worker health, whether it's increased risk for chronic diseases such as heart disease or cancer or diabetes that are particularly associated with some of the health behaviors that many workers might face. And traditionally, we've thought often that those health behaviors like smoking or dietary patterns or being overweight must somehow be um, somewhat segregated from the work, work site. And that if we're going to use the work site, it's just a place to offer some of these educational programs. But increasingly, what we're seeing is that many of the factors on the job actually have a lot to do with those health behaviors. And that's pretty much what the Total Worker Health Program is about, as NIOSH has really articulated so well. And so what I would like to do today is to think about this new paradigm that we might think about somewhat represented through Total Worker Health, and I'd like to present particularly the vision that our center has. Each of the six centers sort of presents a slightly different um, view of sort of the blind people looking at the elephant, and we each kind of look at it slightly different. So this will be more our approach, but um, I think it aligns very well with what many of us are thinking about. So the questions are, what's the value added for this kind of an approach? from a business perspective or a public health perspective? What's the evidence that it might actually even work? And are there some resources that we can use to actually implement this? So this model here is really illustrative of what is a, maybe a standard model of how we might think about how work sites address health and safety. And so it, what this, what this uh, illustrates to me is that there are kind of four different, you might call, call them pillars or functions. The, the first one is maybe how do we support worker health through more health promotion activities that might um, facilitate um, health promotion like smoking cessation or dietary patterns, maybe through educational programs at work, or maybe uh, offering healthy foods in the cafeteria or something similar. Then we have some uh, occupational health and safety uh, efforts. They may be ergonomics. It might be some policies related to reducing potential exposures on the job. Um, but it usually sits in a separate function from the health promotion office. Sometimes work sites additionally have something dealing with stress. Maybe it's how to do stress management, or maybe it's uh, work-life balance. And then there's a kind of a, what we might also think of as traditional HR kind of roles um, that include everything from the um, benefits offices to um, the kind of flu shots, or maybe sometimes the flu shot sits in health promotion. But at any rate, these are usually functioning somewhat separately. And yet there might be some gaps in this approach. There might be some things where this particular approach falls down. And first and foremost, it's pretty segmented. This siloed approach is generally missing some potential opportunities for some integration and coordination, um, some shared decision, some understanding of common priorities across these different functions. Um, it's also um, missing something when we're only targeting individual workers. And I hear often from employers that one of their concerns about their programming is that they don't get many people showing up, and that when we look at the participation rates, it's not just the rates of participation, it's who shows up. And often who shows up are the people who are already maybe going to the gym, have regular memberships, and are pretty healthy already. And somehow the, the people who they may see as really needing these types of programs aren't the ones that are taking advantage of it. So what we're looking at here is that sometimes these individually based programs are, are focusing particularly on some of the downstream outcomes like um, the health behaviors that might be something that we see or the accidents on the job. 
And we're forgetting to look at some of these um, more popula population-based kinds of strategies. And we are increasingly hearing about sort of more of a population health approach that might actually think about addressing these underlying root causes. So that's what I'd like to focus on particularly today. And we might start by asking, I've interjected a few questions throughout here, thinking particularly of those employers in the audience, but for those of us who are not employers, we may want to think about these in terms of how we might work with employers or the kinds of research questions that we might even want to ask. So for example, if you're an employer, where do you sit on this kind of a continuum like this, if it's a continuum? Um, where, where do you sort of situate yourself in terms of the different functions and how well integrated they might already be? Just a starting point for kind of thinking. So as we think about this new paradigm, um, we might begin to think about what are these root causes that we're looking at? And um, Lee presented a, a lovely, um, model of how we might begin to think about these uh, sort of components of the working conditions as being a key part of what we're thinking about as we're moving toward this different way of thinking about worker safety and health. So traditionally, I think we are, from an occupational health perspective, we know that we're dealing with some of these physical components on the job. What can we do to reduce the potential for exposures to health and safety hazards at work? That one is a given and we all share that. But increasingly we're also seeing that these conditions of work go well beyond that. They consider, for example, these organizational factors such as what we've listed here. How many hours a week is a person working? Does, do the hours include having a second job if they're low income workers? Um, do they have consistent breaks on the job? Um, what's the kind of workload and pace of work? And then additionally, we may think of some of the psychosocial kinds of factors that may be things like job stress or a sense of control over decisions that matter to one at work. Together, we kind of put these all maybe into something that we might think of as a culture of health. We use that word um, often and frequently in terms of sort of trying to say, what is it we uh, think of in terms of what the work culture is like? An anthropologist once told me that from an anthropological perspective, you could think about culture as the fish living in the water. And the fish is never really thinking about the water that's surrounding the fish. They're just living in the water, and that's how they breathe. That's how they live their life. They don't really notice it. And that's their culture in a certain sense. And so if we're that employer, employee at worker at work, and we're thinking about the broader culture, what are the components that we don't really think about on a day-to-day -day basis, but that make, make up the experiences that we have on the job, our experiences with our boss or our co workers, the way work is structured, the, um, the pace of work, what happens when something um, with my family goes um, wrong and I need a little bit of flexible time, how is that handled? All of those different components are constituting what we think about as culture. So how does that sort of shape and influence worker health outcomes? In our center, we've started to develop a model that we use in our, in our intervention planning as well as in our research and trying to sort of structure the types of questions that we um, use to really understand this. And we place those conditions of work kind of at, right at the center of our model. And we think of those as really impacting um, these traditional kind of factors like injury or illness, but also well-being. And certainly you can see that they also play a role in health behaviors. And I'll show you some examples of that as we move forward. Um, and our research and others are also showing that these conditions of work also um, have implications for employers in terms of enterprise outcomes like productivity or health care costs or absence and turnover, factors that really matter to the bottom line. So when we're talking about total worker health interventions or an integrated uh, approach to policies, programs, and practices, we're beginning to think not just how can we shape individual health behaviors or, or a reduction in, in injuries, but how can we operate through these conditions of work so that we really create that sort of underlying culture of health, those kind of combined conditions of work that really will shape these uh, um, outcomes that we see here. 
So these are the takeaway messages that I'd like you to hopefully walk away from this talk with today. First of all, um, I've, and I've kind of, this is kind of a summary of what I've just said. So working conditions, uh, uh, as I've said, are, are often the root causes of uh, poor health and safety outcomes. Um, and so improving these working conditions is really an important and very critical step in optimizing these um, health outcomes as well as employer outcomes. So as we think about this, we really begin to think about that means then that a systems approach is really what we need. We, we need that integrated, sort of coordinated approach across these different functions that will really contribute to building this culture of health that we're talking about. This is very well aligned, I think, with what NIOSH is trying to do as it defines here its um, total worker health initiative as the policies, programs, and practices that integrate protection from work-related hazards, traditionally occupational safety and health, with um, promotion of prevention efforts that are going to really advance worker well-being. Um, and I think this kind of fits within, within that model very well. So what's the value added here? How does this kind of contribute to where we want to go? First of all, there's clear evidence that this um, is going to improve the effectiveness of our, of our um, worksite related strategies, certainly in terms of the kind of outcomes we want to see, whether that's health outcomes, whether it's participation, and there's actually clear evidence to show that when we begin to take a more integrated approach where the employee feels that there's, there's changes happening in the overall work environment such that the environment is supportive of health, that they may actually be more likely to participate in some of those programs. Um, so what we're building here is a culture of trust, a sense that there's a reciprocity and, a, and an, uh, um, um, an improvement potential for engagement. These also have um, implications for cost. It can certainly um, uh, reduce absence or turnover, and it can even generate income. Um, whether we're looking at that in terms of job satisfaction or employee engagement that might improve retention of trained, well-trained employees, or whether it means something about how work sites uh, function in the marketplace. I'd return, refer you particularly to this article listed on the bottom by Ray Fabius, a recent publication that really illustrates that um, he's actually tracked market performance of um, employers that actually invest in worker health outcomes and has actually seen uh, and been able to document improved uh, in performance in the marketplace among these types of companies. Um, and so all of this together obviously is also contributing to improvements in brand, um, brand reputation so that employers might actually be able to tr attract the best uh, employees that they, they want to bring into their uh, employment. So for, for employers, we might ask then, how does this approach contribute to your own business goals? And we, we certainly recognize that any type of approach like this needs to be situated into the values and missions and goals that an employer already has. What is the part of the business mission that might fit into the way that building a culture of health might actually make a difference? And we might, um, as researchers, begin to think about how can we articulate some of these pathways in order to help employers actually make some of those choices. So what's, the, so what's some of the evidence? Let me just go over a little bit some of the uh, evidence. And I'd like to give you a little bit of history, um, as well as um, from the perspective of our center, a little bit of where we're at now. I always like to tell a story, and I, maybe many of you have heard this already, but for those of you who haven't, um, to go back to some of my early studies, one of the first studies I did was a worksite study in, um, in, a fa in, in small, in, in actually in manufacturing sites. I was working in Minnesota at the time, and um, I was in a foundry, and I was talking to one of the foundry workers who turned to me and said, why should I quit smoking when I'm just exposed to all these fumes every day? It really doesn't matter. And it was like a watershed moment in my thinking because it really brought home to me that if we're talking about making changes in health behaviors and we're not considering the broader experiences that workers have day to day on the job, we're missing a huge opportunity for actually how we might be able to um, improve some of their outcomes. 
So we tested that um, hypothesis in one of our early studies in our well work study where we actually tried to look at the extent to which um, adding on an occupational health and safety component to worksite health promotion would actually add, add improvements in terms of health behaviors. So we did a, a randomized trial where we actually randomly assigned 15 uh, manufacturing sites to one of two conditions, one that got a standard health promotion program that actually was matched with the other uh, in terms of the amount of intervention they got. The other one really integrated into it that occupational safety and health uh, components. And what we found was as we, um, as we hypothesized, the impact for hourly workers was much different from that for, um, for salaried workers. We didn't really anticipate that we'd see a change for, or a difference for salaried workers because they weren't exposed to some of these hazards on a day-to-day -day basis. It was the hourly blue-collar workers who were really facing those exposures. And as you can see here in the gold bar, we actually doubled the smoking cessation rate among um, blue-collar workers who participated in that integrated approach where we were additionally trying to work with employers to reduce the potential for hazards on the job. So we've now taken some of this work and we've started to try to track some of the pathways. And what we've seen in our recent work is that many of these health and safety outcomes actually share common pathways when we consider the working conditions. So if you go back in your thinking to the model that I presented where we had how do these conditions of work actually shape uh, some of our worker health outcomes or some of these more proximal outcomes. Uh, we've looked across multiple uh, publications at a range of different conditions of work listed here, um, whether we're looking at uh, some of the physical job demands like lifting patients uh, in a medical situation or uh, the extent to which there is flexibility on the job or schedule control or harassment on the job. And we've seen um, a range of uh, shared uh, pathways in terms of the outcomes that we've looked at whether it's fatigue or physical activity or um, uh, pain. So just to kind of articulate this a little bit more, let me just sh uh, share with you a couple of um, particular pathways. So if we look at supervisor support, and we look at how supervisor support might actually be related to something like risk of injury or physical activity or sleep deficiency as examples. We see the positive impacts that this is having on those types of outcomes and the parallel and yet reverse kinds of effects that something like harassment on the job might have on those same outcomes. So as we begin to think about these broad-based thoughts around how do we shape a broad uh, culture of health that's supportive of, work, of worker health and well-being, we can see that these are not separate functions. They're, they're entangled with one another and that as we begin to make changes in these pathways, we can see multiple benefits for worker safety and health outcomes. We've been doing some work as well with um, small and medium-sized businesses, particularly with a partner in um, Minnesota with Health Partners. Um, we conducted a pilot study there and we've done some um, uh, surveys of, of employers in small and medium-sized businesses. And through that work, we've identified a number of different factors that particularly make a difference um, in small and medium-sized businesses. They're not all totally different from other businesses, but I think they matter potentially in different ways for small employers. So certainly we see the importance there of, of leadership support as an ongoing component of that need for, for creating the vision, providing the resources, and setting the tone in terms of shaping that culture of health. Um, that may constitute as well the openness to change and innovation. And the, as I mentioned, the willingness to dedicate the necessary resources to actually make this happen. What we have found particularly, and that has something to do with some of the questions that I've posed along the way, um, is what are the ways that we can link some of these initiatives into some of the existing priorities and infrastructures within um, what, what companies are already doing? So is there some alignment with existing business priorities um, that we can kind of latch a program like this or initiative like this on and, and, and help kind of embed this in what's already going on in the company. So 
as you think about your own work, either with your own company or with other uh, companies that you might be working with, the question then becomes, how does this approach sort of connect to what you're already doing? How does it fit within the existing priorities that, that shape um, the directions that many companies are working in? So let me turn now um, to some, what are, how do we make this uh, sort of happen? Um, and um, just to give you one little simple example, it, it can illustrate some way of how we've been starting to think of working with companies around articulating a plan for this. It starts with, it starts small, and it doesn't start with everything. What, is some of the, what are some of the key pain points that the employer might actually be facing? And how do those pain points actually relate to some of the working conditions that workers may experience. So let's just take one small example. Maybe that point, pain point is uh, the importance of uh, injuries on the job and related costs to those injuries. So in some assessments with, with an employer, we may begin to say, well, what are the underlying sort of root causes, the working conditions that might be contributing to those uh, injuries and, and related costs? Um, in a healthcare setting, we may often see that there's patient lifting involved. Um, and so or other, in other set settings, there might be something related to lifting other heavy items as one possible example. So it might mean, how do we then look at the, the lifting plans and policies that are in place? If it's, a, if it's related to safe patient handling, what kinds of um, uh, mechanical lifting uh, devices or other strategies are in place to actually help with that process? So it starts with that sort of pain point, that outcome, and works backwards with a systematic assessment to sort of say, how can we kind of figure out the organizational strategies, such as policies, that might really make a difference in the working conditions that we're thinking about underlying these factors. Our center has recently developed a little um, a manual that we have on our website, um, free of charge to anyone who would like it. Um, and we're, um, one of our goals here was really to articulate a process that employers might actually want to use um, in implementing this kind of a strategy, hopefully using planning processes that are very well aligned with the kinds of approaches that many employers are already using. So in conclusion then, what does this all mean for small businesses? Um, if you're a small business uh, sitting in the audience, you may think about some of these issues. Or if you're a researcher or somebody else, you may want to think about what, is this, what are the implications of this for the kind of research we're doing. But we may start with um, how might we improve working conditions um, as a way of adding value, uh, not only in terms of worker health outcomes, but potentially as well to the bottom line. And that may start with aligning um, some of those um, approaches um, with existing business priorities. So it's not something totally new and different, um, but can start small in small incremental steps with things that might already be happening. Um, so for just an example on this, um, we've worked uh, closely with um, one employer in, in the Boston area that um, is a healthcare provider. And as we worked with them, um, we realized that one of their key priorities was, um, uh, was patient safety. And it was that focus on patient safety that actually got them thinking about safe patient handling, safe patient movement. And we began to see that that could actually tie in very, very well with uh, an approach to think about worker safety. Um, so how can we then link those priorities around worker health and safety with those existing sort of business objectives? So it might mean then starting with um, the company's own root causes, um, whatever that may be, to build that success in small steps in the way of considering um, the systems approach to building a sustainable culture of health. So with that, um, I leave you um, with a, a hearty thank you, a, a reference to our center's website once again, and please follow us on Twitter as well. Um, and I'm hopefully leaving time for questions. So thank you very much. We have, we have about uh, five minutes for questions. And if we can ask people to please come to the microphones so that everybody can hear. But uh, we'd love to have some, some uh, questions on this elegant talk.
Thank you for that presentation. Uh, we're interested here in particularly in small and medium-sized enterprises. So how would you see introducing systems approaches at different uh, sizes of, of companies or, or companies differentiated in different ways that relate to size? I think that's a really good um, question, Paul, and um, our work with small businesses has not been on the tiny side, the mini um, five to ten, but a little bit larger than that. And what we have observed <coughs> particularly is that um, a couple of things, um, there oftentimes um, some of that first slide that I showed with those different um, silos that might function in many companies, for many small businesses that might are, that might represent how business is done, but it might be for some places that they're all kind of concentrated in one person. And so it might actually make the integration process a little bit easier because it's not like you're always going across separate departments, but maybe you're bringing together one or two people who need to um, kind of share priorities and begin to think about systems in a way that really works. Um, for many small businesses, there's already a sort of a, a sense of a family culture where I think that that, that, sense, that more personal environment sometimes exists and it's possible to build on that kind of uh, smaller culture where most people are maybe knowing each other already and so there might be um, additional channels for employee engagement that might be a little bit more challenging in some, um, in some uh, larger companies. So I think there's some assets to build on. There's also some particular challenges because I think we also hear from many small businesses that they just don't have the resources to be able to do all of this. That it's, that it, that thinking uh, that, that there's the impression that this is going to require huge investments. And that's part of the reason that we really focus on this idea of how can we start small and incremental rather than trying to boil the ocean from the get-go. So can we pick um, a small, uh, doable, uh, winnable kind of early success, kind of the the, the low-hanging fruit, if you would, and think about how to build uh, towards success so that it can expand gradually. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, Ahmed El Bayati from Western Carolina University. You talk about culture and you describe it as a fish, and this is very nice and very true. I did a few research with, uh, in construction with Hispanic workers, and there's cultural differences there. Mm -hmm. So, is there any practical tools that we can reach individuals with different culture to tell them more about the whole environment that we have in, within our company or? or even country or something like this? My guess is, is that there's going to be some conversation about this very issue throughout the conference. Is that correct yes. to some extent? Um, so, uh, so from the perspective of different cultures, I think that is really an important issue. And how do we begin to think about the representation of diverse cultures within a given, a given, a given workplace? In construction in particular, um, our work in construction has seen that there's especially challenges because oftentimes workers are moving through the, their workplace. And so what we've started doing within construction is not just thinking about the individual work site where the construction is happening, but how can we additionally work with subcontractors who might, maybe trade-based subcontractors, who might be seeing the same work workers over time going from one work site to the next. And we might have a, a better opportunity in, in that kind of a situation, building an ongoing sense of continuity going forward from, from one construction site to the next, thinking about those subcontractor groups and not only the work site. Um, but I think you raise an important challenge that we all need to keep in mind as we're thinking about this. What do we think about not only of the workplace culture as a whole, but the subcultures that might exist within that workplace? Really good point. 